Welcome back, everyone. Up next, I want to talk about another numerical integration technique, a very powerful one, which we call Simpson's Rule. And so here I have the formula for Simpson's Rule written up on the board. We're not going to derive Simpson's Rule in all the excruciating detail that we might want to, but we are going to talk a bit about where it comes from and why it is one of the better approximating techniques. It's a lot more complicated than some of the other formulas we've been using for approximations. And the kind of idea there is, well, this better approximation is going to come at a cost and that cost is, well, it's a little bit more complicated to use. But our formula is we're going to take delta x and divide it by 3 and we're going to multiply every single term in this sum by that delta x over 3 value. And so our sum is going to be f of x naught plus 4 times f of x1 plus 2 times f of x2 plus 4 times f of x3. And then we're going to have this nice kind of alternation between 2 and 4 times our f of x values until we get near the end of our sum. So in between here, we're just bouncing back between 2 and 4, 2 and 4. So the term right before this 2 times f of x sub n minus 2 would be 4 times f of x sub n minus 3. After this 2 times f of x sub n minus 2, we add to that 4 times f of x sub n minus 1. And then when we get to the very last term, we're just at a regular f of x sub n value, no multiple of f of x sub n. So the way I remember uh, Simpson's rule is the first term in our sums are just our regular terms, f of x naught and f of x sub n. The next inner terms are going to be multiples of 4 times some f values, then multiples of 2, back to multiples of 4, back to multiples of 2. So we're always bouncing back and forth between these multiples of 4 and 2, except for the very last terms. And the other thing we have to watch out for is that we're not just multiplying by delta x, but delta x divided by 3. The other really, really important note that we can never forget when using Simpson's rule is Simpson's rule is actually only going to apply when n is an even number. Remember, n is that little subscript, so we denote Simpson's rule as s sub n, and that's just telling us how many subintervals we are using in this approximation. So we're only going to be allowed to use Simpson's rule if we have an even number of subintervals in our approximation. All right, so here I have a picture drawn of some arbitrary function and its curve, y equals f of x. And remember, when we're working with a definite integral, we always have that interpretation as we're just finding the area between our curve and the x-axis over this interval from a to b. All right, so in some of our previous approximation methods, we've seen that we can approximate the area underneath this curve using rectangles. That's what we did for the left endpoint, right endpoint, and midpoint rule. But we also started to see that we could actually approximate these regions using shapes other than rectangles, right? Our trapezoidal rule used trapezoids to find the area in each of these regions. By instead of saying, this looks like a rectangle, maybe it looks like a trapezoid instead. And well, we can do this with just about any shape that we want. Some shapes just might be harder or easier to work with than others. And the idea behind Simpson's rule is instead of finding the area of one of our subregions using a single rectangle, instead what we do is we find the area of two adjacent subregions at the same time by approximating the area underneath that curve or the area in the subregion as the area underneath some parabolic curve. This can get a bit weird, and we're not going to go into all the fine details of deriving this formula for Simpson's rule. We're just kind of getting a glance at the big picture of what's going on behind the scenes. And so behind the scenes is we're kind of taking these adjacent subintervals. That's why we need an even number of them, because we always have to stick two of them together. So we're going to stick these first two subintervals together, and then we're going to think about our curve over this region. All right, this is the curve over our region of those first two subintervals. And then we're going to think of, well, maybe we could approximate that curve using a parabola. We know our parabola should go through those three points. And one of the special properties of these parabolic or quadratic functions, as long as our points aren't all lying in a nice line, we can find a parabola that goes exactly through those three points. So maybe in this first little region, our approximating parabola might look something like this. And so then what we do is we find the area underneath that approximating parabola over the interval from x naught to x2 or over those first two sub intervals. This is where we're going to start skipping some of the details because how do you find the area underneath this parabola? 
Well, the first thing we have to do is find a formula that expresses the parabola in terms of these three given points from our subintervals. We would use those points to find the equation for our parabola, and then to actually find the area underneath our parabola, we'd have to use a definite integral. And I always thought this was kind of weird because what are we doing in Simpson's rule? We're approximating a definite integral, but the idea is the original definite integral is probably a complicated one we couldn't compute using something like an antiderivative. So instead, we break it up and approximate it with a bunch of simpler definite integrals involving quadratic functions. And so, well, for our next iteration or the next step in Simpson's rule, we've already taken care of approximating the area for these first two subintervals because we joined them together. Then we move on to our next two subintervals and join them together to think of that as one big subinterval. Well, then we would use, again, three points corresponding to the end points and middle point of this new bigger subinterval. And well, with those three points, we could find a parabola or quadratic function that goes through those three points, we can then set up another definite integral to find the area underneath that quadratic function. And that'd be given by this area in green over here. So we could add the area underneath this parabola to the area underneath our first parabola. And that'll give us a better approximation for the area underneath our curve than if we use something like a uh, rectangle or a trapezoid instead. And of course, we'd have to do the same for our last two subintervals, join those together. Those endpoints of those two subintervals give us these three distinct points that'll be on our parabola. Maybe this parabola will look something like that. Use another definite integral to find the area underneath that third parabola. Now this is the part we're gonna skip. We could take the time to go through and express all these points and parabolas in terms of the outputs of our function corresponding to these different endpoint inputs, x0 through xn. But when we go through all that algebra and busy work, this is the formula that ends up popping out. So I think we're about ready to look at an example using Simpson's rule to make an approximation. The thing to remember though, uh, besides the formula for Simpson's rule, and this is what kind of this small derivation was all about, is that we can only apply Simpson's rule when we're working with an original even number of sub intervals. So we can't use like S sub seven or S sub five. Our subscript has to be an even number. Otherwise, Simpson's rule doesn't apply. Welcome back, everyone. In this example, we're going to see how we can apply Simpson's rule to help us approximate one of our definite integrals. And so our definite integral of interest is the integral from 0 to 1 of the function e to the power of x squared. And here we are asked to approximate this using Simpson's rule with n equals 6 or with 6 subintervals. And so this is, I think, the first example we're seeing where we really have to use one of our approximation methods to make any progress with this integral because e to the x squared is one of those functions that does not have a nice antiderivative that we can write a formula down for. And so really our only chance of getting close to the true value of this integral is using an approximation like Simpson's rule. So to get things started, we're going to have to find all these pieces in our formula. Maybe we'll start off with what is our delta x value. Remember, delta x can always be given by the formula b minus a over n. b is your upper limit of integration, a is your lower limit of integration, and n is the number of subintervals you are using in your approximation. So b minus a over n gives us one-sixth for our delta x value or the width of each of our subintervals. The other thing we're going to need besides the function itself when using Simpson's rule is those, in this case, six distinct endpoints. And well, our first one is going to be our lower limit of integration. x0 will be 0. Then x1 will be 1 sixth. x2 will be 2 sixth or 1 third. x3 will be 3 sixth or 1 half, and so on. We could also always use that formula that x sub k is equal to a plus k times delta x to quickly generate our subintervals endpoints. So now from this point, we have all of our little setup work done. Now it's just a matter of plugging everything into our Simpson's rule formula and calculating it correctly. So S sub 6 is going to be given by, well, we have to divide our delta x value by 3. That's going to be the factor we have to multiply every term in our sum by. Our delta x value is 1 sixth, and if we divide that by 3 or multiply it by 1 third, we're going to get 1 18th. 
And so now the first term in our sum is going to be our function evaluated at our far left x value, or x naught. Well, our function is e to the x squared. I'm just going to use function notation to make this a little bit easier to write, and you are welcome to do the same. So it'll be f of 0. We have to add to that 4 times f of x1. What's our x1 value? Well, it's just 1 sixth. And so that'd be 4 times e to the power of 1 over 36 if we were doing this uh, by hand, or we'd have to enter into our calculator. Our next term is going to be 2 times f of our next x value. We just have to go 1 sixth over in the x direction. So that'll give us 2 sixths, which we could write as 1 third. But I kind of like to leave it as that unreduced fraction just to make sure I'm not making any mistakes going from these different endpoints. Now our next term is going to be a 4 times something, right? Because the previous one was 2. We're always alternating back and forth between these multiples of 2 times the value of our function and 4 times the value of our function unless we're at the very ends of our sum. So we're going to have 4 times f of 3 sixths. Run a little low on space over here, so I'm going to jump down to this next line. We have to add to this 2 times the value of our function at 4 sixths. Next is going to be 4 times something. That something is the value of our function at 5 sixths. And now we're at the very last term in our sum here. That's not going to be a multiple of 2 or 4. It's just f of our far right endpoint, which was 1. So we have to add f of 0, 4 times f of 1 sixth, and so on all together. Once we have that number, we can multiply it by 1 18th or divide by 18. And what we end up getting is that our Simpson's rule approximation with n equals 6 is approximately 1.4, I have to look at my notes here, 6, 2, 8, 7, 3, 4, 5, 5. And so with the Simpson's rule approximation, we know approximately how much area is between this curve and the x-axis on the interval from 0 to 1. One thing that we can't do at the moment with this example that we were able to do with some of our previous examples is find the actual error, right? Uh, to find the actual error, we have to know the true value of our integral. And because we can't find an antiderivative for this function, that is not something we are able to do at the moment. But this does raise some interesting other questions like, well, if we don't have an antiderivative, how can we have an idea of how much error is in our approximation? And if we don't know the exact value, are we able to control the error in our approximation? And we will be able to do both of those things in just a little bit.